Surprise! I'm not actually a dummy, I hope, but Peter Spencer bidding you welcome on behalf of Cornwall Stress-Free Television to the Cornwall at War Museum just outside Camelford. Simply charming party, but a bit deceptive. The clue's in the name, really, at war. They've also taken one or two small liberties with the chaps here. Had they looked as they do in this room, during their training at least, they'd have been told in no uncertain terms to get your hair cut, you horrible little man! But they're spot on with what looks like their age. It was RAF policy in World War II to recruit chaps still in or barely out of their teens. Because they were like young men today who've just passed their driving test. Fearless, arguably crazy. Ha! <laughs> I know I was, and I've heard it said that these guys would party like there's no tomorrow, then in the morning take a good snort of the oxygen supply they'd be relying upon at altitude to give themselves an energy boost before they set out to do or die. Like I say, this was war. After the Dunkirk retreat and the darkest hour, it took the Battle of Britain to repel the expected invasion. And boy, did we have a fight on our hands. Following the humiliation of World War I and the economically crippling outcome of the 1919 Versailles Conference, the Germans meant business. When the RAF saw off enough of their fighter planes to make them change tack, they decided to soften us up a bit with bombs. Attention, attention, it is almost certainly either a false alarm or a drill. I may be mistaken. The Luftwaffe managed to take out a third of London, even scoring a direct hit on Buckingham Palace with the King and his Queen in residence. Naturally enough, the Royals headed for their private bomb shelter, a bit like this, but possibly a tad posher and later headed off to see other ravaged areas of the capital. The Queen Mother was heard to remark memorably, I'm glad we have been bombed, now we can look the East End in the eye. But the RAF was fighting back hard, air defences were getting better and more airfields were getting built. Airfields like this one here at Davidstow, which at one or two key points in the war played a vital role, hence the idea of putting the museum here. Now, Steve Perry, who joins me now and who dreamt up the idea, reckons it could hardly be more site-specific, right, Steve? That is correct. The airfield was put here at 970 feet above sea level, which makes it the highest airfield in the country, to get above the sea fog that plagued all the coastal airfields in Cornwall. All the other airfields are, al are along the coast, and all except one are on the north coast. So if the sea fog rolls in, it closed all the airfields. So when they needed another airfield with long enough runways to accommodate four engine heavies, they came up onto Bobmin Moor and built their airfield to escape fog, which does seem a bit strange, but that is the reasoning behind it. But what gave you the idea of setting up a museum of this nature in the first place? Well, my wife, who happens to be my commanding officer, Sheila, and myself <laughs> are both avid collectors. And we were amassing a, an enormous collection of military and military vehicles and all the kit, and nobody ever saw it. We would sh take some vehicles out to the rallies at weekends, but the rest of it just remained in a big hangar at home. So the museum really is a way of getting the collection out on display so we can see it and other people can see it also. And of course, your interest in military stuff, I mean, you served in the armed forces yourself, did you not? Yeah, back in the 70s, I was in the finest regiment of the British Army, the 1st Battalion of the Light Infantry. And what rank were you? I was a general, sir. A general dog's body. I was a private soldier. And did you see action here and there? I served in Northern Ireland, but I travelled the world with the battalion. Central America to a place that was then known as British Honduras. It was a crown colony, it's now Belize. Went to Canada, Hong Kong, and twice to Brunei, attached as a signaller to the Jungle Warfare School. And that was really the genesis of your interest in, in collecting military me memorabilia, I guess. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my me, me wife bought the first major item, which was um, a World War II GMC six-wheel drive American Army lorry. And then, well, one vehicle's lonely by itself, so we better get something else. And then the pig arrived, and then we got the ferret. And then we start getting the equipment to go with it, and it just grew and grew and grew. And you have the air of being a Cornishman, so did you get the idea of 
here specifically, just you cast around. You must have looked for sites, I take it. Well, for years, we had it in the back of our mind, one day we're going to do a military museum. We had all sorts of harebrained ideas. Mm -hmm. It had to be a military site. It didn't have to be specifically RAF, Navy or Army, but it had to be one of them. And then it came to our attention that this field here, with the old derelict officers' buildings on, and the, the local farmer who owned it was quite happy to sell it to us to create a museum. Did it cost you an arm and a leg? And the rest. <laughs> it has cost vast sums of money and enormous amounts of work. But we are very fortunate. We have a strong and loyal band of volunteers who work here, all for nothing, all sorts of skills. And many of the volunteers have been with us from the very beginning, way back 12, 13 years ago. Some of them have been with us since then. And so, I mean, do you make anything like a living out of it or do you rely on your military pension? Well, I, no, I haven't I am got a military pension. We do have another business, but the business finances this. There's no way could this ever make money. This is just a hobby. It is a money pit, really. It's just a hobby. That said, it's obviously fun as far as you're concerned. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Turning up in the morning, opening the gates, first thing we do is make a cup of tea, which was a far cry to when we first came here to a derelict field. It is a pleasure. I love walking around seeing it, and the people we meet are truly incredible. We meet some amazing people here who come through the gate. We do get lots and lots of visitors. Do you get any German visitors? After British, I would say Germans are the most numerous. It'll be a close-up between the Germans and the Dutch. We get vast numbers of Germans and vast numbers of Dutch. But we get people from all over the world. But Germans, because they say, Back in Germany, you can't see this sort of thing. It's, you know, it's, you just can't have it. Anything with Nazi on it is, is certainly banned. I see. And do they, any of them have any little stories about how they tried to bomb the place, for example? Long before we did the museum, a German tourist went to a local cafe on the A39. And he asked, is there an airfield near here? And they told him, yes, and told him where it was. And he said, no doubt in a German accent. I didn't think it existed because he had been sent on missions to bomb the airfield and they could never find it. Now, when I was told this story, when we started doing the museum, that puzzled me because a massive airfield, even at night, out on the moors, exactly three miles from Brown Willie, a very prominent point, I would have thought they could have found that. But I later discovered that the airfield was painted. All the runways were painted, all the taxiways, everything was painted to camouflage it. And not just this airfield, Britain painted all our airfields. All the tarmac, all the concrete, the buildings, everything was painted to camouflage it. And if relevant, they paint hedges, trees, buildings, anything on them. But they had a system of lights to bring in our own aircraft. But of course, they didn't turn them on for the Germans, which would probably be banned today under... Racial discrimination, I expect. <laughs> Very good, thank you, that's fabulous. To accommodate all these visitors, unarmed Germans or otherwise, Steve's amassed a huge collection of gadgets and weapons, including this monster, a fairy gannet, big enough to drop not just bombs but torpedoes. There's also a hawker hunter, like the one that crash-landed, spewing its ammunition everywhere, in the middle of Tintagel in 1979. A petrol tanker was nearby, about to make a delivery to a local filling station. Fortunately, the driver spotted the problem in time and put his foot down hard, and the plane miraculously came to rest between two buildings, the mother of all near misses. Lucky it wasn't during the war, judging by this pump attendant. Note the fag. And there's lots in this museum that captures the feel of the home front during the hostilities. Shortages of everything, especially food. And the constant fear not only of air attack, but also of being spied upon. It's all here. There's even a mini cinema to flesh out the details. No effort spared. The equipment, the stars, you name it, it's all here.
On top of all that, there are written records shining a spotlight on the daily lives of people who've served in bases like this. It says here that there was a gentleman who got 56 days detention for half inching a oncer. That's stealing a pound note to you. And also, good heavens, there's a temporary warrant officer who was reduced to the rank of sergeant for introducing a waff into his bunk. That's a lady in his bed. And there was me thinking it was only the Americans who were over here, overpaid and oversexed. <laughs> Actually, the jolly old colonials were here in force. Likewise, 304 Polish squadron. They were ace fighter pilots. Even the Polish president in exile came to David Stowe to thank them for their efforts. But the big push from here came when British and Canadian pilots were tasked with protecting the Allies' western flank during the D-Day landings. They managed to take out three German destroyers, so it was job done and presumably therefore the end of the war, and you would have thought for this airfield as well. But was it, Steve? Well, by late 44, the Allied armies are now advancing across Europe. The U-boat pens are back in Allied hands, and the U-boat threat is greatly diminished. So the aircraft get moved forward because this was too far away, but it became a muster station for troops of the RAF regiment, and they were brought here to go out onto the moors to train for jungle warfare. Totally bizarre. It's called jungle warfare training without trees. And vast numbers of them were trained here. They then went out to the Far East to protect Ford operating strips. This is, this is the airfields largely captured from the Japanese in the jungle. And of course, the Japanese would be in there sniping throughout the day. And their job was to defend the airfields. December 45, RAF David Stowmore closed but it became a Ministry of Supply Depot for a while. All sorts of government surplus was brought in. They held auctions here and stuff was disposed of. Vast amounts was burnt out on the moor. And then that was completely the end. From a military point of view. In 1950, uh, Cowan Gate set up the first cheese factory on what was the old women's quarters. Today, of course, it's Dairy Crest. And Formula One racing arrived here in 1952. Totally bizarre how remote we are, but it was a Formula One racing circuit from 52 to 56. Presumably at that point, the, the, the runways were still in very good condition. The runways were still in very good condition. Um, an RAF aircraft, from what I understand, did use it from time to time. A vampire, similar to the one you're standing in front of, did an emergency landing here in 1949. His, his engines cut out, and it was the nearest available airfield because there's nobody around and no mobile phones or nothing. He had to walk for miles before he could find a farm that's got a phone so he could report where he was. And I can imagine that, that for the, going back to the Formula One racing, that, that, the, F, that the, the airstrips were so wide. I mean, I can remember me as a kid, my dad actually allowed me to drive his Armstrong Sidley at 60 miles an hour along, along one of the runways on the grounds. It was just quite impossible for me to hit anything. I imagine that's, that was for these guys. There are vast runways built for bombers. I mean. They're wider than what they look now because the grass has, has actually encroached on them. For the Formula One, they build a pedestrian bridge right across the main runway so people could cross over. 25,000 people will be here to watch Formula One racing, which is nearly as many as go to the Royal Cornwall show in a day. Sterling Moss raced here and Lotus had their first ever win here. It wasn't a Team Lotus car, it was a private purchase, but Colin Chapman was here to actually watch his car win. Wow, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? And then there was also a visit from Memphis Bell. Yeah. Um, the very first people to use this airfield at the end of 42 were the Americans. It was built for the British, but the Americans were the first to use it. They were going to bomb the U-boat pens around the Bay of Biscay to try and disrupt the U-boats to allow their convoys to get from America to North Africa for Operation Torch, the Allied landings in North Africa. They couldn't find the U-boat, so the best way was to disrupt their re re resupply. But they could not fly from East Anglia, their bases in East, in East Anglia, and up in the southeast, up in the east, all the way down to the Spanish border and back with a full bomb load. They couldn't. They couldn't carry enough fuel, so they needed the longest runways possible, as far south as possible, and it was Davidstow. So RAF Davidstow more actually opened early 
to accommodate the Americans, and they came in with liberators and flying fortresses. This went on for a few months, but they maintained a lodger unit here, so that whenever their American bombers were operating down over the south of France, they could come in and refuel, and the Memphis Bell did it on a number of occasions. And how was that received? I expect they brought lots of goodies with them, so I'm, I'm sure the RAF chaps were, were, were quite happy to see them, I expect. And tell me more of the history. What, what, the, what, what does Memphis Bell actually mean? Well, Memphis Bell is the first American bomber to complete her tour of duty. Um, back at that time, RAF crews completed a tour of duty of 30 bombing missions. They could then stand down. Americans had to complete 25. And the very first American bomber to complete the 25 was the Memphis Bell. And at the time, the Americans made a documentary of it. And then she was flown back to America to do a flag-waving job around the States. So she became quite famous, and then, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, Hollywood made a version of the Memphis Bell, which is actually very good, considering it's American. <laughs> Today, much of the original three-runway airfield is being gradually reclaimed by nature, though the control tower is still clearly visible. Because he has got the space, he's also got the room to put full-size things in it, like this copy of one of the defining images of World War II, the Doodlebug. Actually, it's the only replica here. Everything else is the real thing. But here it is, the flying bomb that's cast terror into the hearts of all those who heard it coming, and even more so to those who heard it stop, because it meant it was about to land on them. And here's a little tip for the German handlers. It says here, Nicht anfassen, which in English means do not touch. Very clearly back in those days, missing the target was regarded as verboten. But somehow or other, we got through it all. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler, if you think old England's done? We are the boys who will stop your little game. We are the boys who will make you think again So who do you think you are killing Mr Hitler If you think old England's done Mr Brown goes off to town on the 821 But he comes home each evening and he's ready with his gun So who do you think you are kidding Mr Hitler if you think old England's done